All right, guys. So last time we were just talking about civil liberties. Civil liberties are your constitutional guarantees that protect you, an individual, from who? From the government. From the government. And where can you find these guarantees? In the Bill of Rights. In the Bill of Rights of the Constitution. It used to be that these guarantees only protected you from which government? Federal government. Only federal government, but now it also... States government. States well, government. not all of them. Most not all of them. them. Most of them because of what? Selective incorporation. Which is what allowed selective incorporation by the 14th Amendment's due process clause. If you're lost, make sure you come with tutoring. That should be all self-evident by, by now. Today, we're going to be talking about civil rights. Although they sound the same, there there's differences between civil liberties and civil rights. Civil rights protect you from discrimination. Go ahead and write that down on your notes. They protect you from discrimination. Civil rights protect individuals from discrimination based on sex, religion, gender, race. They protect you from discrimination. Here's the unfortunate thing about our Constitution. There is no, when it was originally written in 1787, there was no guarantees of civil rights. There was nothing stopping of the federal government or the state governments from discriminating on its citizens. The word equality did not exist in the original draft of the Constitution. Once we added the Bill of Rights in there, still no mention of equality in the Constitution. Still no protection against discrimination from government. What changed all that? Where can you find, where's the only place in the Constitution that has equality in it. The Equal Protection Clause of which amendment? The 14th Amendment. That's why I told you this is one of the most important, this is the most important amendment in this class. The 14th Amendment says, no state can deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. What do we call that sentence? Without due process of law. So that's what? That's the due process clause of the DPC that allows for selective incorporation. But right now, that's not what we're interested in. We're interested on the second part of the 14th Amendment, which says, no state can deny to any person within its jurisdiction the what? Equal protection. protection. Equal protection of the law. What do we call this clause right here? Equal protection. Equal protection clause. So here's the difference. The due process clause of the 14th Amendment extends what? Civil rights or civil liberties to the civil states? Liberties. Civil liberties to the states. What prevents states from discriminating? What extends civil rights to the states? The equal protection clause. Any measure, any law passed by a state that would be considered discrimination would be in violation of the equal protection clause. The equal protection clause extends civil rights to the states. No state can now discriminate on its own citizens. Does that make sense for everybody? Yes. It's equal protection clause of the 14th Amendment forbids the state from discriminating on its own citizens. Everybody good so far? All right. So, civil rights protect individuals from discrimination. The word equality does not exist in the original draft of the Constitution. Even the Bill of Rights doesn't have it. It guaranteed civil liberties, but it didn't guarantee civil rights. However, after the Civil War, the 1860s, states were finally limited from discriminating by the what? 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. If you know what EPC means, you should be fine by putting, putting EPC in there, but well, that's up to you. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to be reviewing this next semester, so make sure that you know your abbreviations, guys. Anyone have any questions so far? Now, the Equal Protection Clause, go and write that down again. You're going to be writing that down a lot. The Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment is not the only thing that prevents discrimination in the United States. It's not the only thing that prevents government from treating you unequally. There are also other amendments that protect civil rights, and there are also laws passed by Congress that protect civil rights. So we're going to talk about some that you should know already in your head from U.S. history. Which amendment protects your civil rights by outlawing forced labor? What is forced labor? Or slavery is slavery, so that would be the 13th Amendment. The 13th Amendment makes sure that no more black people are put into slavery. Which one gave citizenship to all that was born in the United States? 15. It is the 14th. That also gives you civil liberties. That means they cannot say that black people who are born here are not citizens. That's not allowed because of the 14th Amendment. But the 14th Amendment does a lot for us. 
citizenship included. Oh, by the way, for the 14th Amendment, anybody who's born here is a citizen of the United States, except for who? Women. What? Yeah, it's true. Are you it doesn't say women, well, like, but it didn't apply to yeah. women back then. Oh. Except for Native Americans. Next, number three, which <laughs> amendment gave the right to vote to anyone born in the United States? 15th. 15th. Any male that was born in the United States. Which again protects from uh, from discrimination by the states, because technically back then, guys, when it comes to elections, who controls elections? According, according to the Constitution of the United States, who has the ability to control elections? States do. And what did states do yeah. with that ability? Voting rights amendment. They didn't allow women to vote. They didn't allow minorities to vote. So these are required to stop the states from doing that. Next. Gave suffrage to women, everybody should know that. That is the 19th Amendment. Created in 1919. There are also some laws that guarantee civil rights that um, protect you from discrimination. Anybody know of any law passed by Congress that protects you from discrimination? That protects your civil rights? The Civil Rights Act of 1965. The Civil Rights Act of 1965. Very good, sir. Civil Rights Act. Of, go ahead write that down in there, please. Civil Rights Act. Don't need to put the date on the legislation passed by Congress. So that little thing right there. So a Rights Act of 1965. We'll talk about that law today. Anybody know what other laws protect you from discrimination? Civil Rights Act of 1968. <laughs> right? Isn't that another one? I actually don't know about that. I don't know if that's real or not. I don't know <laughs> I thought it was real. It might be real. Might be real. I don't know. Um, the Voting Rights Act also protects you from, from being discriminated upon, especially in the voting booths. We'll talk about those in a little bit. But when it comes to civil rights, the one that justifies it the most is the Equal Protection Clause. And what's going to happen because of the passage of the 14th Amendment, the Equal Protection Clause will motivate and inspire many different groups who have been discriminated upon for years in the United States to ask for equal protection, to ask for equal rights. This is a big deal. This is a question on your homework tonight. Equal protection clause will inspire social movements, social reform movements in the United States. It will inspire groups of people who did not have equality before to look for equality. Because before, if you were a black person, if you were a woman, there are th you want equal rights, but there's nothing in the Constitution that gives them to you. But now you have it with the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. This is going to inspire um, the women's rights movement in the United States. This is going to inspire the civil rights movement in the United States also. The 1960s Civil Rights Movement for African Americans. It's going to inspire, today, the LGBT community. These groups are going to be inspired by the Equal Protection Clause, looking for equality. Because there's a justification now in the Constitution of the United States. Believe it or not, even anti-abortion groups or pro-life groups have used the Equal Protection Clause to defend or to argue against abortion. So this is going to inspire a lot of movements. So what do you put in the 1960s? What happened in the 1960s? The Civil Rights Movement. The Civil Rights Movement. The African American Civil Rights Movement led by Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, all those people that you've talked about in U.S. history. Equal Protection Clause is their main justification for looking for or wanting equal rights. Oh, I'm sorry guys. The 14th Amendment justified and motivated social reform movements like these on, on the bottom. Social reform movements. Hey, so you're pro-LGBT, sir? What's up? Let's get Brett today. I'm not against you, Mark. Oh, Alright, the Civil Rights Movement of 1960s. So we'll talk about this right now. A little history before we move on. When was the United States founded? 1776. When did we write the new constitution? 1784. Sorry? Wait, 83. 1784. Constitutional convention of what year? 1787. 1787. Awesome. Was there civil rights then protected no. by the constitution? No. And two years later, in 1788, Sorry, 1789, we added the Bill of Rights to the Constitution. Was there a protection of civil rights? No. 
No, we're not going to get, a, get that until when? 1965. Until when? When, did the, when was the 14th Amendment ratified? Around the 1860s. Around 100 years later, we get protections on civil rights, but we're going to have to pay for it with the Civil War. Um, the Civil War lasted four years. At the end of it, 600,000 Americans are dead. Um, and it was actually a good thing, a good thing for African Americans, because not only did we get all those Reconstruction Amendments, 13th, the 14th, and the 15th, which granted equal rights, or some equal rights, or equal protection to African Americans, the rebellious states of the Confederacy, these states that you see on the board, these states are the ones that seceded from the United States, after the Civil War, we're going to take away their statehood, which is not going to let them, which is going to limit them from passing laws that would discriminate on black people. We took away their statehood, we took away their state government, and we didn't allow them to pass their own laws. For a while in the United States, these states were divided into what we call military districts controlled by the federal government, and they weren't allowed to pass their own laws, which is a good thing for black people living in these states, because if they were allowed their own governments, they would have passed laws that would have discriminated on black people. But then Reconstruction ended, and one by one, these states got their statehood back. And with that, they got their state governments back. And they started passing laws that would discriminate on black people, trying to go around the 14th Amendment. We call those what kind of laws? Jim Crow. Jim Crow laws. After the Civil War, state and local governments in the southern states of the United States, including our state, or one of the naughty ones, passed Jim Crow laws. They are designed to enforce racial segregation and discrimination. Racial segregation and discrimination. A lot of these should have been a violation of the 14th Amendment, but sometimes the Supreme Court looked the other way. Like, in the next case we're going to talk about, but remember, Jim Crow laws separated the races, segregated, so you have images like these where black people are not allowed to sit in some drinking fountains, they're not allowed to sit in the front of the bus. Those are all state laws that demanded that and were enforced during this time. And then we get the Supreme Court um, succumbing to state pressure in Plessy versus Ferguson. Plessy versus Ferguson is not a required case, but you need to know what happened in Plessy versus Ferguson. Plessy versus Ferguson is about a law in Louisiana called the Separate Car Act. In Louisiana, it is illegal for a black man to be in the same railway as a white man. They have separate railways. It is illegal for them to cross over. They're segregated completely. One man, his name is Homer Plessy, he challenged this Louisiana law. He's one-eighth African American, and he decides to go sit in the white rail car. And he gets arrested for it. What is the justification for his complaint, for his challenge? The, the, those railroad cars? The law that separates us in the railway cars is a violation of what? What's the, the argument? 14th, the 14th Equal Amendment's what? Equal protection. Equal protection Clause. Because it's Louisiana doing what to its citizens? Discriminating in its citizens, uh, to its citizens, so it would be a violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th. Does that make sense for everybody? Yeah. So far. Did the Supreme Court agree with him in yes. Plessy versus Ferguson? Wait, no. No, they did not. Yeah. They said segregation is not discrimination. Separating people based on their race is not automatically discrimination. It's not automatically a violation of the 14th Amendment. You can separate people. You can give them different buses. You can give them different railways and, and um, drinking fountains. As long as these accommodations are equal. are equal. As long as the railways are the same, as long as the schools are the same, as long as the buses are the same, and it's legal. there is no discrimination and therefore no violation of what? The 14th, the 14th Amendment the Equal Protection Clause. Plessy versus Ferguson established the president of Separate but what? Equal. Separate but equal. You can separate the races as long as the accommodations are equal. Equal books, equal teachers, equal buses, equal drinking fountains. As long as they're equal, you're not discriminating on anybody. You're not treating anyone in a fair way. It's not a violation of the 14th Amendment. Does that make sense for people? Yes. What is, what is the reality that the Supreme Court are inherently unequal? It's not really equal. 
there was a statistic that Oklahoma was spending five times more in white schools than they would in black schools. The drinking fountains are not the same. The buses are not the same. But this particular ruling justified what in the South? Segregation. It justified the, uh, the southern states segregating their citizens. Because the Supreme Court is perfectly fine with it, it's, they said it's not a violation of the 14th Amendment. So, what do you need to put in here? 14th Amendment's what? Equal protection, so you get used to it, EPC. The Supreme Court established a separate but equal doctrine. Segregation is not necessarily a violation of the 14th Amendment. If each race is provided with equal accommodations, equal accommodations, if it's equal accommodations, then it should be fine. This ruling gave justification for state segregation back then. So bad times for African Americans during this time. Moving along. Now, if they wanted to change it, if the African Americans had difficulty with these policies, they always have the voting booth. However, that right is also limited by the southern states. Remember, the ability to control election requirement belongs to who? The states. States, election belongs to the states, so they can decide how, what are the requirements to be able to vote. And before, they said no black people allowed in the voting booth. But now they can't do that anymore, why not? What else? Besides, that would be discrimination. There's an amendment in there that says they can't do that anymore. 15. The 15th Amendment, right? Which says everybody that's born here can what? Can vote. can vote in the United States. So they can no longer do that. Because if Texas, for example, which was a racist state back then, even probably today, if Texas passed a law that says black people are not allowed here, they would be in violation of the 13th Amendment, and they would be in violation of the 14th Amendment because that's also discrimination. So they're not allowed to say that outright, but what can they do? What, what's the purpose of those? To limit minorities. So they can't say outright, you're not allowed to vote. Because if they do that, they would be violating the Constitution's 13th and 14th, uh, 15th Amendment. 14th and 15th Amendment. But what can they do instead? Just make it harder. Just make it harder. Make it more difficult so that they're unlikely to exercise that right. We can't take that right away from them, but we can make it harder for them to exercise that right. So how do they make it harder for them to exercise that right? What, is the, what are the literacy tests back then? It's the Bible. They're state-mandated tests that you have to prove that you can do what? You can read and write. If you cannot prove that, what happens? You can't vote. You can't vote. Who's more likely to be illiterate during this time? Or a lot of Americans, minorities are less likely to be able to read and be able to write, so it affected them disproportionately. But then, during the 1960s, they noticed a lot of these black people are getting educated, and these literacy tests are no longer effective. So what they decided to do is make the tests harder. They pass what we call government tests. Instead of proving how you can read and write, you need to prove your knowledge of the what? Of the Constitution and the government of the United States. It's like a government test that we take in class. If you get a 70 or below, you can't vote. You need to pass in order to be able to vote during this time. Um, my CP classes, their final exam is the Alabama 1953 <laughs> government test. If they can't pass it back then, you're not allowed to vote. You're not gonna get that easy of a test. Don't, don't even look it up. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, do only black people have to take this? Can they do that? Can they say only black people are, are going to take this test? No, they just say everyone takes it. Has to be everyone. It has to be everyone. Why? Because that's the same for people. Five people. Because if they only said black people, they would be in violation of what? The 14th, the 14th Amendment's what? Because that would be a form of discrimination. Thank you very much. So, they got around that. They got around the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause by including in their little laws about government tests and literacy tests by including a little sentence that we call the grandfather clause. In those laws, there's a little sentence that says, if your grandparents have voted before, then you don't have to take the test. Oh, wow. Which means what? If you're a white person, is it likely that your yeah. grandparents have voted before? Yes, yes. but if you're black. If you're black, your grandparents were probably what? Slaves. They were probably slaves, and they've never seen a voting booth their entire lives. So that's a way to get around the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. 
by saying, yeah, everybody has to take it, but there's a little exception if your grandparents have voted before. So, southern states are smart, but very evil. This is something that we've had in, in Texas also. I even understand this draw a line around the number. So since states have the ability to control election requirements, they made it more difficult for African Americans to exercise the right to vote. Oh, by the way, other things that made it harder is poll taxes. What are poll taxes? A fee to be able to what? Oh. Vote. And who's less likely to afford that? The minorities. 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 So these election procedures disproportionately affected African Americans in the United States. It didn't affect white people that much. It affected disproportionately African Americans. They have to like find loops around the law, around the Constitution, to be able to do the racism. They apply that that cleverness to something else. All right, and then we get the Civil Rights Movement, fighting for equality in the voting booth, fighting for against segregation. In the 1960s, the Civil Rights Movement combat these oppressive policies through peaceful, what we call civil disobedience. Civil disobedience. This is a big topic in this class. You need to know what that means, civil disobedience. What are civil disobedience? I know you guys talked about this with Mr. Luna. I don't know if you talked about it with Mr. Valero. What is civil disobedience? It's a form of peace, but still. It's a form of protest, yeah. but what form of protest is it? Silent. It's peaceful, number one. That's a one characteristic. It's peaceful, but what? It has teeth because. It is, civil disobedience is a practice of disobeying laws that you feel are unjust. So you're breaking the law, but you're doing it in a peaceful manner where no one gets hurt, and you're, you're breaking the law as a form of protest. So if you feel that a law is unjust, then all you have to do is disobey it. So this is something that connects the world to US history. A long time ago, the guy that came up with this term is a guy from the Transcendentalist Movement. I don't know if you all remember Transcendentalism. Um, his name is Henry David Thoreau. Henry David Thoreau um, was famous for, during the Mexican-American War, he hated the Mexican-American War, and he decided, I don't support my government, I don't support what my government's doing, so I'm not gonna pay my taxes. That's civil disobedience. Oh, God. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Still, so, that's the case. I'm ready. I'm sure you are. Been ready your whole life. All right. <laughs> Moving on. So that's civil disobedience, breaking the law as a form of protest. So sit-ins like these, they're technically breaking the law because they're not allowed in these places, but they're disobeying a law that they feel is unjust. So why are we talking about civil disobedience? Because one of your required documents that you need to read, although I'm not going to make you read all of it because it's like 10 pages long, I heard that you guys read this in English. Oh, yeah. The letter from a like, Birmingham oh, yeah. yes. jail. I heard you read this in AP English. Those of you that have AP English. I'm not going to make you read the whole thing because there's key points that AP wants you to understand and that's what we're going to cover. Although it's a good thing to read the whole thing because he is a brilliant writer and speaker. So who's the author? Martin Luther King. King. He was a civil rights leader. He's also a religious leader during this time. He wrote it in an Alabama jail. He was sent to jail because he act, he did what? Civil disobedience. He broke a what? A law. He broke a law as a form of protest. Um, he wrote it for fellow clergymen fellow people from um, people that are serving in churches because he was getting criticized during this time civil rights movement and him were getting criticized during this time for doing exactly what we've been talking about breaking what breaking the law they said the civil rights movement have to learn how to wait you can't just be breaking laws they feel like breaking laws is something that is immoral if you can decide which laws to follow and which laws not to follow who can decide that. Nobody should be able to decide who, what laws to follow and what laws not to follow. So a lot of these clergymen are criticizing Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement for doing civil disobedience. Matthew, you gotta read this because I'm tired. This is the quote that you need to remember for your 
for AP exam. We know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Frankly, I have yet to engage in a direct action campaign, campaign that was well-timed in the view of those who have not suffered unduly from the disease of segregation. For years now, I have heard of the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with piercing familiarity. This wait has almost always meant never. We must come to see with one of our distinguished jurists that justice too long delayed is justice tonight. All right, so key points. We know through painful experience that freedom is never what? Voluntarily given. If you want freedom, what do you need to do? You must work for it. You need to demand it. And how are they demanding it during this time? Civil By civil disobedience, right? And he says, they've been telling me to wait, but they've been telling us to wait all these time, but... This is too long, it's just... Exactly. Justice too long delayed is justice denied. So the purpose of this letter is the letter critique the idea that civil rights demonstra demonstrators should wait until a later time. He believes that time for justice, the time for equality, is always when? It's always now. Um, to pursue racial justice, and that is that it is immoral for protesters to break the law. That's what they were accusing him of, of doing. Wait, exactly. King argued that there are two types of laws, just laws and unjust laws, and one has a moral ob obligation to do what to unjust laws? Disobey. It is your moral obligation to disobey unjust laws. It is to support the concept, what, what are we, what is he supporting here? The concept of what? Civil disobedience. The nonviolent protests of breaking laws as a form of punishment. Does everybody get what civil disobedience is? And the purpose of this letter? If you're confused, let me know. All right. Now the government is going to respond to all these calls of freedom and all these calls for equality. And one way they're going to respond is through a landmark Supreme Court decision, Brown v. Board of Education. Put a check mark on this because this is a required case. You need to know the facts. You need to know the constitutional question. And you need to know the decision made by the courts. Oliver Brown had a daughter, Linda Brown, and enrolled in a Kansas school. In Kansas, like in most of the southern states in the Union, schools are what? Schools are segregated. So schools are separated based on race. He challenged the constitutionality of segregation, where specifically, in what context? In schools, in public schools, in the Supreme Court. He said, this is a violation of which amendment? The 14th Amendment's what? Equal protection clause. But he has a hurdle because there's a president established by what? By Plessy versus Ferguson, that's what's okay. So everybody but equal is okay. So that's the hurdle that he has to, um, to um, overcome. Thankfully for him, he had a very good lawyer. His name is Thurgood Marshall. He's one of the leaders of the NAACP. And someday, right now, he's just a lawyer arguing for black people. He's also African American. But someday he will become a Supreme Court Chief, uh, Supreme Court Justice in the Supreme Court. So right now he's arguing for black people in the Supreme Court. Later on, he will be one of those justices. So the question in Brown versus Board of Education, is segregation in public school a violation of the what? The Equal Protection Clause, EPC of the 14th. So one of the compelling arguments that Thurgood Marshall made is they introduced, um, they had children, African American children, ages 6 to 14, come into the Supreme Court. And they offered them two dolls, one white doll and one black doll, and asked them a question. And they asked, which one would you rather be? Almost all of them chose what? White one. White one. And then they asked them another question, and they said, which one are you most likely, which one are you most like? And they started crying. And a lot of them left the room because they couldn't handle it. Because they know the answer, and the answer would be the black one. And they couldn't handle that. And here's what Thurgood Marshall proved. These children are in, have, been, have grown up in schools that were what? Segregated. Segregated. And it instilled within them a feeling of what? Shame. Shame. They feel that they're lower. What do we call that? 
uh, the scrotated feel their inferior. They instill within them an inferiority complex. They said segregation in public schools, so Thurgood Marshall argued segregation in public schools makes people feel unequal, makes people feel inferior. If it makes people feel unequal, it's a violation of what? EPC. Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. It doesn't matter how equal the accommodations are, which they weren't, but it doesn't matter how equal accommodations are. If I was a black student back then and I was being separated from white people, I'm going to feel like there's something wrong with me. And they said, separate but equal is inherently what? Unequal. That's what the Supreme Court said. They agreed with Thurgood Marshall in this particular case, which kind of turned what president upside down? But only for what context, though? Public schools. schools. So the Supreme Court ruled, in its decision, the Supreme Court ruled that in the field of public education, separate but equal has no place. The Supreme Court ruled that separate but equal educational facilities for racial minorities is inherently unequal. And if it's an equal, it's a violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th. Because it instilled a sense of what to the students? Inferiority, inferiority to the students. A sense of inferiority to the students. Why is this uh, ruling so important? This ruling was a crucial victory because black people are going to be able to use this president to fight for, against segregation in other aspects of life. So there's this president that was set in public schools and they're going to be able to use that in other cases that are not dealing with public schools. So later cases challenging segregation will be built on this president, set in Brown versus Board of Education, P-R-E-C-E-D-N-T president. So that president, that establishment of the president that there's no segregation in public schools, that's going to be important because they can use that president in other cases. It effectively overturned the separate but equal doctrine established by Plessy in regards to what? Schools or public education. But the crowning victory of the civil rights movement is this next one right here. This is their crowning victory, and this is the thing that's... Brown versus Board of Education only eliminated segregation when it comes to public schools. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 is going to take care of the rest. Brown versus Board of Education didn't eliminate segregation in restaurants. It didn't eliminate segregation in hospitals. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 will. Congress passed a legislation along with the President of the United States, because he has to sign off on it. Anybody know who that president right there on your, on your notes? LBJ. That's LBJ, Lyndon B. Johnson. And this effectively ended segregation in public places. In public places. Buses, restaurants, hospitals. Segregation is now over. Furthermore, not only does this benefit African Americans and minorities because of the end of segregation, it also benefited women because it banned employment discrimination based on race and gender. They cannot hire you just because, they cannot refuse to hire you just because of your religion, your sex, the color of your skin. So employment discrimination is also banned now. So this extended what? Civil liberties or civil rights? Civil rights. Civil rights, obviously. Civil rights act. All right, those smart people in my class. Yes, sir. This is the federal government making a law that controlled businesses in the United States, private businesses like restaurants and hospitals. What allowed them to do that? This is the federal government passing a law that will control private businesses. Interesting. Interstate what? Interesting commerce. Commerce what? Commerce, commerce what? Right. Because the federal government can control what kind of commerce? Interstate. Interstate commerce. And we know from the Supreme Court's interpretation that the Commerce Clause can pr mean pretty much what? Anything. Any economic activity, including restaurants, including hospitals. That's why they were able to do this. Everybody get that? Yeah. Made that connection? Yeah. All right, so Commerce Clause right there. You can put Interstate Commerce Clause or Commerce Clause. Hopefully that makes sense to all of you. If not, let me know. Alan, you gotta wake up. All right. Another crowning achievement a year later is the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Oh, this is one. This one will outlaw all the things that we talked about in this class that would make it what 
harder, to harder vote. for African Americans to exercise their right to vote. So outlawed all procedures that made it more difficult for African Americans to exercise their right to vote. Like what? Old taxes, old literacy. taxes, literacy tests, all of those now gone, now illegal. If Texas passes a law that would make it more difficult for you to exercise your right to vote, then they would be in violation of the Voting Rights Act. This would increase minor uh, minority turnout in the voting booth. Not only that, minorities tend to vote for other what? Minorities. minorities. Hispanics tend to vote for Hispanics. African Americans tend to vote for African Americans. So this would increase the amount of minorities in what? In government positions. Increase the amount of minorities in government positions. So that's a good thing. The 24th Amendment eliminated poll taxes in the United States. It banned poll taxes. Kind of double did it. Uh, talk about the women's rights movement. Again, what justifies these women, these uppity women, from wanting equal rights? What justifies them from wanting equal rights? So this is right. All men have equal rights. What justifies them? What constitutionally justifies them from wanting to be equal? Um, the 14th Amendment what? Equal protection. equal protection clause. Remember how important this is because it serves as justification for wanting those rights, for getting those rights. All right. Before the 1920s, those of you that know your history, hopefully you can answer this, the women's rights movement was focused on one thing. What are they focused voting. on? Voting. Suffrage. Achieving suffrage, the right to vote. But in the 1920s, in 1920 specifically, they're going to get the 19th Amendment, which gives them the right to vote. So after getting the right to vote, women have used the Equal Protection Clause, EPC, of the 14th Amendment to justify calling for more civil rights, equality, whatever you want to put in there. More civil rights, equality, whatever you want to put in there. All right, so there's one group that you need to know about. The National Organization for Women, also known as what? Now. They're also known as now. They work to increase uh, women in education and employment, increase women's business opportunities, to try to end or limit sexual harassment in the workplace. So these people are fighting for women's equality in the United States. And they have continued to fight for it ever since 1966. Here's a question. What will we call this type of group? Interest group. There are interest group. Go ahead and write that down. An interest group. They're fight they're connecting the people's concerns with the what? With the government. That's why it's called a linkage institution. Today, what are the women the what is now fighting for? Pay exactly. Comparable work. Comparable work is equal pay for equal work. Equal compensation. Now there are some people that believe that this is not the case, that men and women are actually getting paid what they deserve. I don't want to get into that debate. Let's do I it. Debate. I want to debate with you. Uh, we don't have time. So how did the government respond to women's rights movement with the 19th Amendment giving them the right to do what? Women's oh. suffrage. Suffrage number two, Civil Rights Act of 1965. How is that helpful not only for African Americans but for women as well? Because it banned what? Discrimination. Where? In, in a... Uh, Where? Public places. Yeah, but that's the word for race. And employment opportunities. And employment. It banned employment discrimination based on gender. So that's something that women owe the African American rights, civil rights movement also. That's a victory for women as well. And everybody should know, number three, Title Nine of the Education Amendment Act. What does Title IX do? Without looking at your notes, what does it do? If, if an organization breaks the, the, the uh -huh. Civil Rights Act of 1965, they can remove funding, if it's federal funding. So, you should know, a lot of you know this Title IX in the context of athletics, right? Like, you can't gender discriminate in athletics. It's actually deeper than that. Marco's correct. We know that the federal government provides money to schools, correct? It provides money for UIL, it provides money for athletics, those computers right there in the side of my room, those are paid for by the federal government, you can see them, federally funded. Now, if the government, the federal government is giving the states money for a particular program, this particular law states that they're not allowed to discriminate based on what? Gender. Gender. If they do, what happens? What's they the punishment? 
they can remove the funding. So right now, if you are a woman and you're trying out for the football team, if they don't let you try out, if they're getting money from the federal government, that money is going to get removed from the federal, uh, by the federal government. And this is not only for high schools, universities are also getting federal funding as well. So in athletics, if the guys during practice are taking off their shirts, then the girls can argue that why do they get to take off their shirts when it's hot and girls can't. Whoa. <laughs> I, don't want to that I feel like that would be a freedom of speech issue because of obscenity and stuff like that and you may not have a case because obscenity is determined by the community so if the community thinks something is obscene then I, mean, I agree with you, you should be able to do that no one should be complaining about that alright moving on so, prevents gender discrimination and harassment in federally funded school activities, school programs. If I only let girls in those computers, then those computers can be taken away from me. You have a case against me because I'm violating this law. This is an example of federal government influencing the state's bio what? Federal funding. Because we know, we know guys, that schools is whose domain? States. So how is the federal government be able to control harassment and discrimination? Using what? Commerce. Not commerce clause in this time. What are they using? How are they making the states obey this? Funding. What do we call the funding that comes from the federal government? It starts with a G. Grants. Buy your grants. Alright, moving on. Pro-life, they have used the Equal Protection Clause to argue against abortion. This is something, for some reason, is on your AP course description. Although it's kind of obscure. All right, be a lawyer. Argue against abortion using the Equal Protection Clause. If you don't like abortion, you're pro-life. Argue against abortion using the Equal Protection Clause. Give me arguments using either equal protection clause. Whose right is abortion protecting supposed right. Who's not being protected? The child, child. The fetus inside. Because a lot of these guys, they consider the fetus inside as a what? As a person. As a person that should have all the rights as everybody else has. So their argument is abortion does not protect the persons inside the womb's right as equally as they do the women. Everybody go with that? Yeah. All right. So have, have used the equal protection EPC or EP, which is what they the case, to argue that the right of a fetus must be equally protected also. They argue that abortion denies the person inside the womb equal protection of the laws. They are not being equally protected by the law. All right, so those of you that are making essays about abortion, that's something that you can put on there. All right, next one is the LGBTQ groups. Again, they've also used the Equal Protection Clause to argue that they deserve more rights. They have been denied equal rights for a long time. In 1996, with a Democratic president and Republican Congress, they passed a law that is a big hit against LBGT rights in the United States. It's called the Defense of Marriage Act. Here's what it says, two things. Number one, it defined marriage for the federal government, for the federal government alone, as what? Between women and men. Being between one man and one woman. Which means for the federal government, if you are married to a person of the same sex, you're not what? You're not married. You're not married because that's not how they define marriage. What does that mean though? What's the actual real life consequences of that? If the federal government is providing benefits to a married couple, do gay couples have the same thing? No. no. no because technically what they have is not what for the federal it's government? Not equal. It's not marriage for them. Not that it's not legal, it's just they don't recognize it as actual marriage. Everybody go with that. Yeah. All right, second thing. It allowed the states not to recognize gay marriages. It allowed the states not to recognize gay marriages. So the federal government says, that marriage is a state's domain. It's up to them whether or not they're going to issue out marriage licenses or whether or not they're going to uh, recognize gay marriages. So look at the map on the, on the board, guys. 
This was only 2015. This is like three years ago. The states that are in brown do not issue marriage certificates to gay couple, and they do not recognize gay marriages. So if you were a gay couple married in Vermont, and you went on vacation in Texas, technically you are not what? Married. You are not married anymore. Suddenly your marriage disappeared by just going to another state, because that state does not recognize your marriage. I won't go with that. Next blow against um, gay people in the United States, the don't ask, don't tell policy. This is a military policy. Everybody should be familiar somewhat with this. What is this about? That if you're gay, you can't go to the military. You can. Oh, but you don't have to. All right, so this is what don't ask, don't tell us. You can be gay and serve in the military. However, they're not going to ask you if you're gay. And you can't tell anyone that you're gay. If you tell somebody that you're gay, they can kick you out. But you go with that. So you can be gay in the military as long as you're not openly gay in the military. Does that make sense? <laughs> this is because, according to them, if there's a gay person and he's known to be gay, it's going to disrupt unit cohesion. While we're in battle, people are going to be worrying about sexual tension and stuff like that. All right? This law never made sense to me, in my opinion. Regardless of what you believe about morality of homosexuality, these people still volunteer to die for you. And you're kicking them out just because of what they are. I'm a coward. I'm like scared of the draft. I would never do what these guys did. And they've had the courage to do that. And we're kicking them out just because of who they are. There have been stories, horror stories during this time about their commanding officers looking at their journals and then when they see that they have some gay tendencies and they kick them out. There have been stories where um, they were promised that this is confidential. Their confession is confidential and no one's going to know. And then it came out that they were gay and they were kicked out of, of, of the military. That's don't ask, don't tell. Military, po uh, military policy that denied gay servicemen the right to openly serve as a gay person in the military. You can be gay in the military as long as you don't tell anybody that you're gay. That's still a thing today. No. Okay. We'll talk about that right now. LGBTQ rights have justified their quest for equal treatment using what again? 14 TPC. 14 TPC. 14 TPC. Protection laws. All right, today, Congress, in 2010, a Democratic Congress and a Democratic president, obviously, who was the president in 2010. Obama. President Obama passed the Don't Ask, Don't Tell Repeal Act, and that policy is no longer the case today. You can be an open gay person in the military now, and they can't kick you out anymore. But before that, then if you tell anybody you're gay, they kick you out. All right, let's finish this up. So, Obergefell versus Hodges, this is the Roe versus Wade of your lifetime. This is where they declared DOMA unconstitutional. They said that states have to recognize gay marriage because if they don't. Re because the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause compels them to recognize gay marriages all over the United States. So the court ruled that the 14th Amendment guarantees same-sex couples the right to get what? Married. married. Not only that, not only do they have the right to get married, the 14th Amendment also requires states to license and recognize gay marriages. So it's not like this anymore today, guys, because of Obergefell versus Hodges. All of that is green now. Because states are forced to recognize gay marriages and they're, all, they're forced to issue out licenses. Because if they refuse, that is a form of what? It's a discrimination, which will be against the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Law. You have homework. I realize I didn't give you homework last night. Because I know you're working really hard. I just forgot. To. But you have homework tonight. It's not that, it's not that big. Have a good day, guys.